Hello everyone, welcome back to a brand new video. So today is a very special day. Today is the 22nd of September. It is World Rhino Day, which for me is quite close to my heart because I am quite passionate about rhinos if you haven't already been able to work that out based off my other videos. But without trying to go on for too long, I got to speak with the one and only Grant Folds last night, who for those of you who don't know, he's the ambassador for Project Rhino, which is an organization based in KwaZulu Natal in South Africa. He's also done a lot of work with Rhino Art, which was founded by um, the great Kingsley Holgate. And Grant has also done the co-founder, along with his brother William, the co-founder of Amakala Game Reserve in the Eastern Cape. So he's really such an expert in the field and I was very fortunate to speak to him. I'm just going to play that little interview for you now and hopefully you can learn something new from someone who I found quite inspirational and he is the reason I'm wanting to go into wildlife conservation one day. But yeah. Um, so if we can just start off with some of your background and how you got into rhino conservation. Yeah, Dylan. Um everybody asks me that and it's a very difficult one i think it's yeah. possibly because we bought our first rhino as uh, well over 20 years ago um, and took them to a game reserve which i um, co-founded called amakala yeah uh, my brother and i and um, they've since bred up and and done well and and like everybody else we've had our own rhinos poached you know which is yeah. like killing your pet um it breaks your heart and um yeah I, we we kind of uh, not only fell in love with rhinos but uh, the whole ecosystem but uh, for some strange reason uh meeting kingsley holgate rhino art um and the fact that my brother was involved in tandy the yeah. as a vet and um you know it all just came together and and yeah that my my book obviously saving the last rhinos is, is quite embarrassing because it's not me that's saving the rhinos uh you playing your part even as a young pupil trying to be passionate about an animal that's very very threatened yeah um i want i want to bring up tandy a bit later as well just to find out um but also, like with World Rhino Day, it's a day that brings a lot of awareness to the species and makes people um, and everyday people who aren't necessarily as close to those ecosystems and seeing those impacts firsthand, yeah. um, starting to think yeah. about it. what sort of advice would you give to people um, and what they could do to help? Yeah, I mean, World Rhino Day is a very special day for us. It's also in um, Heritage Month. Runners are part of our heritage and, uh, you know, everything is colourful. Some people call it National Pride Day and there's the World Cup going on as well, you know, the, the Rugby World Cup. So I think um, uh, people that are passionate about conservation per se or people that have a passion for um, the pachyderms like rhinos, mega herbivores, should just take note and and um, acknowledge these creatures and see what's happening to them, you know, and, and and why they're being slaughtered. And the most dangerous thing in the world for somebody is to to not know anything. And that's what we we refer to as theories of change, you know, um, to let people know there's a problem, and to let people know that if we don't do something, there's going to be disastrous circumstances so and that and hence the fact that people need to acknowledge these things on a particular day and we have pangolin day we have rhino day we have giraffe day and and every one of them is just, just one of those remembrance occasions where we need to stick up our hand and try and do something constructive for for a species for a particular species in this case it's the, you know the oldest living mammal on earth arguably the oldest living mammal which is yeah. a dinosaur on a, you know a living dinosaur at 55 to 60 million years old yeah and obviously going with that con that education sort of route you also are quite heavily involved in the rhino art um 
which goes to, from my understanding, goes to different local community schools and stuff to help educate. Yeah, so, yeah Rhino Art has been to nearly three quarters of a million children since I've been involved. Founded by the great philanthropist and uh, most traveled man in Africa, Kingsley Holgate, um, who inspires us even to this day. He's actually doing it now with Africa Parks throughout Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and he's in his late 70s. Uh, I've actually been to your school. Um, it was a great honor to to go there. And you may ask why I go to a very smart school in the middle of Cape Town. It's because of champions like you, you know, and Hunter Mitchell. Um, so in each school, there's a champion like you, you know, and, and that's the reason why we go and they instigate other kids and, and pupils to do more. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, if we don't educate the future of our future leaders, uh, we're going to be doomed. Um, I'm I'm already over the hill, and it's time that the younger generation take over. Now, you asked why um, we go to smart schools and not to rural schools, because most of our 95% of our education and our awareness campaigns are in schools that are impoverished around national national parks, provincial parks, and private game reserves. And the only reason why we go to other schools, um, because they already know about the thing, is because A, they have some resources, being money, um, and B, they are able to, um, they have champions like you. And C, you know, they, they're the affluent leaders uh, uh, of tomorrow, really. Yeah. So that's the reason why we stick to some of these schools, to finance those that are less fortunate than yours. So obviously one of the biggest threats to rhinos is rhino poaching, but in addition to that, what other major issues are you seeing with their, their future? Yeah, the most, well, other than the poaching, um, the, the biggest threat to them is, um, is space range. We call range expansion, and that's where the world would rewild in perfect habitat. You know, you cannot put them, in on a beach you cannot put them in a desert they need water if they're browsers they need bush if they're grazers they need grass so you have to have ideal habitat um you also have to have protection um and you know you've got to have a lot of space so one 500 kilometers to a thousand kilometers per mega herbivore is the normal range but we have overpopulated them in some places and they've been successful. But rhinos, by the very nature of their bulk, their size, their mass that they intake every day, and they are quite, um, the males are, are quite dominant. So they fight with others. They, they definitely need their space. Um, you know, they don't do well in a captive. Having said that, they've done pretty well at John Hume's place, but they do better in the, in the wild. In a free range open system than when they then they're being fed in a in a feedlot system. And then obviously also like if we look at like KZN, uh, we've seen quite a drastic change to poaching heading that way instead of Kruger. Um and there's a lot of theories that it's related to corruption within those box. Would you agree with that sort of statement or not really? Yeah, I've just come from there today. I've been in the park and we've been discussing all these problems that have been happening. So um, there is obviously corruption. There's people that aren't happy with their, their work in their workplace, perhaps. Um, there's some people that at the top that, are, that aren't fit for their, their work uh, um, and that have been promoted pretty quickly, so therefore they didn't have the skills. Um, and... Unfortunately, one doesn't know in this game because the prize is so high, the money is so good. One never knows who the enemy is. It's quite a sad situation because even today I was driving into Mfilozi Park and I see a nice house and I see a guy in a flashy car. And I'm starting to think, well, is that house built by blood, sweat and tears or is it a rhino kingpin, you know? And, and you start doubting yourself as to who has benefited from a rhino inside a park and you almost get paranoia because you don't know who your enemy is and he could be amongst you um hopefully not 
So I would say a lot of the poaching is uh, the information, put it that way, is internal. Um, the actual deed is not done by the people in, involved. The, the deed is done by people in, in, a, in a syndicate, and they all have their roles in that syndicate. Yeah. I was doing some job shadowing down at Infodu and Private Game Reserved, um, which is just outside of Cape Town. Um, and they were yeah. I was one of the um, park managers, and he was telling me about the incident that happened at the end of 2021 where they lost five rhinos, and that was also due to inside yeah. job security, giving information to local communities yeah. and to get in and all that. So it is quite sad to see that coming more and more popular, even on the small reserves with very few rhinos who... Yeah. Yeah, I remember that said day um yeah and then i think they also did not you know they had their anti-poaching unit but they didn't uh, you know they underestimated yeah. they you know it's all the same old thing it's never going to happen to me you know yeah um oh. and that that's the same with the a, a house in Rondebosch. you know we say it's never going to happen to me i've got a dog uh, you know, I'm protected. I've got ADT securities or whatever, and and yet every person or every household sometimes has has their turn. You know, and that's what happens in rhino poaching, unfortunately. What would be your ideal envision for future rhinos and what they should live should live like, and what's your ultimate conservation dream? Yeah, I th think that my ultimate dream is obviously to. Um, <laughs> this would never happen because poaching is never going to go away. We've um, it's here to stay, and and we've just got to make it very difficult. So, if it was utopia and and people were living in harmony, and there was no, you know, when we first started rhinos, they were they were like our sheep. Um, they just got poor cattle. They were put into the game reserve, and nobody worried about them. You'd see them on a drive, and nobody had to guard them or secure them or anything. And that was. 2003 to 2007, even 2008, there was there was very little or no threat at all. Um, we knew that Africa had its problems because of civil war and they were utilizing rhino horn. And even our own South African Defense Force in Angola killed rhinos as a sport, you know. And obviously they say that they did sell the horn, but they, they killed them as a sport because they were abundant, really. Just naughty boys playing with guns, you know. Um, had no idea that this calamity would happen in the world 30, 20, 30 years later or 40 years later. So in the, in the ideal world, um, Dylan, uh, I think that I would love to see, um, like with Africa Pox now and they, what they've done with John Hume's rhinos, they, they, there's talk of rewilding them. That was actually an idea that I had as well, and it was well documented at the time. To take off two to three hundred rhinos, it's virtually the same mirror image you read in the press, and and rewild these areas and make them safe as safe as you can in the most pristine places in Africa, and introduce these rhinos that they may thrive and breed up from, you know, the the twos and the fours and the tens and the four hundreds yeah. that we had in the sixties. Do twenty thousand or thirty thousand, and where rhinos are taken off a critically endangered list, and they become endangered as in black rhinos or, yeah. uh, or endangered just become threatened as in they do in the white rhinos which are not just endangered they're not critically endangered because yeah. we've managed to breed them up to 15 or 16 thousand in south africa alone so you know we have um, 80 over 80 percent of the white rhino population and nearly 40 percent of the black rhino in the world yeah so yeah and and obviously letting tourism play its role if tourism can play a role in rhino conservation and also, we need to have a value in rhinos. If there's no value, we are doomed. And at the moment, the white rhino value has dropped so much um, that it's very difficult. They're so expensive to run, and people are just saying, we cannot afford to keep rhinos. Yeah. So if you cannot photograph them, or if you cannot sell them for a profit to another reserve to expand that other reserve in Africa with money, and biodiversity credits. Like biodiversity credits are the big wealthy people in the world, in the Western world, putting money into credits from um, over-exploiting the, the world 
and hopefully that that will be able to save an endangered species. Yeah. Um, you brought up Tandy earlier, who is obviously a major success story. Is if you had to give one success story, would that be her, or do you have any others that you'd like to share? Yeah, that's it's not my success story, unfortunately. It's my brother's, and when you write a book, um, I've written two now, and I'm busy with my third. But they say never, never tell another man's story. Um, Told it very well, <laughs> and uh, it's just my brother's story. So yeah, I, I mean, I because I was involved um, in 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 Kerecha, actually involved in the Gaza story, which was the beginning of this whole thing with my brother. William. Um, I felt that because it was in our family and that I had a, a kind of a license to to tell the story. Um, but no, I, I, I wouldn't say that in my book that's not the most successful. I think there's certainly other things that are more successful or as more as ex- successful, and that is the amount of looking back, the amount of white runners in private land ownership. Um, in South Africa is dramatically increased. It's got its challenges. That's not a single one. That's a collective. Um, But for me, uh, the day I start my own new rhino range, which is now going to be Luziba, um, and the rhino step off there, and, you know, we have 10, 20, 30, maybe 100 I can look back in my rocking chair and say that was that beats every other successful rhino relocation. And obviously, I'm trying to do rhinos in Uganda, Tanzania, um, more in Zimbabwe. Um, So hopefully, those will be my, you know, the the next success stories. But I feel like I'm still learning. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to the day when that happens, and I'm cheering you on all the way um but yeah so thank thank you thank you so much for taking the time to let me interview you i will personally be donating 500 rand to um, project rhino my family's also agreed to match that as well um thank you have a good evening stay safe good luck okay all right dylan keep up the good work eh? you too all right mate cheers bye that was really a very inspiring and motivating call for me. Grant, if you're watching this, thank you so much for taking the time once again to chat with me. And if, as I said, I will be making a donation to Project Rhino, but if you at home would also like to make a donation, I will be leaving the link to Project Rhino down below so you can go check them out and make a donation as well. I'm sure no matter how small, it will go, all go a long way in helping protect our rhinos for future generations. If you would also like to check out some of Grant's work, you can go and check out his book Saving the Last Rhinos or Rewilding Africa that he co-wrote with Graham Spence. Um, They're available in most major bookstores like Reader's Warehouse and exclusive books as well as on Take Lot. Um, And I'm sure all around the world there you can find them in your local bookshop as well. But yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and hopefully you've learned something new and taken something away from this. But until next time, stay safe, um, stay well, and I will hopefully see you very soon in a brand new video. Bye!